Hello, good morning. It is Monday. I'm so excited to see you here. I was feeling a little flapper inspired. I have a cute little bow in my hair. Hello, 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 hello. Karen is going to join us shortly. I just thought I'd pop on here a little early. I am outside, barefoot in the sunshine. I got my booch. I've got my little booch glass tea. What flavor y'all sipping on today? This for me is one of my favorite summer flavors, elderflower lemon. Hello, good morning. Nice to see you. Oh, Karen's here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and bring her on, but yay, I'm so excited to share with you today. She is an amazing, um, resource and a fabulous friend of mine. So I'm really excited to introduce you all to her. And we are a little early today, but um, let's see how long it takes to get to connect. Hi, Karen. Hey, Hannah. So good to see you. You look gorgeous this morning. Oh my God. Look at your jewelry and your hair. <laughs> I love it, love it, love it. <laughs> Thank you. You look beautiful. <laughs> Everyone should start their Monday morning like you. <laughs> With the kombucha. Yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> you know what? Let me get my hang on. I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah. Karen is really fabulous. She um, not only has a blog about cooking at Karen is Cooking, she also invented this really cool thing that you can see in her video right now. Not, okay, but I'm gonna show we gotta do this about. together, right? All right, here's mine. <laughs> we'll do a cheers. Woo! What flavor you got? Bush. Yep. All right. Happy kombucha hour Monday morning at nine. <laughs> chin chin. <Yeah>. Cheers. <laughs> what's your yep. What's your flavor right now? You know, um, mine is uh, roses. And also, um, the tea that I use was um, Dragonwell. Ooh. Yeah. Roses. Really and so this one, tea. I think, with a touch of vanilla. <gasps> like vanilla bean? Is that how you get it in there? You know, you know, this one, I cheated. I just poured some vanilla extract. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Yeah. That works, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's really nice. And, of course, it's the starter that I got from you, like, oh, gosh, years ago. Yeah. Fun! Yay! Yeah. That's so cool to hear. I'm glad yeah. it's proliferating. Yeah. But um, well, we're just a little bit early today. But I thought I would go ahead and introduce you and read a little bit of your bio because I really love this quote. So let me just introduce my friend Karen here to you. Um, Karen is a classically trained chef, nutritionist, author, and expert fermenter, and chief fermentation officer of CrowdSource. She's passionate about sharing delicious recipes that also promote health and well-being. Top of mind for everybody these days, health and yes. well-being. Yes, absolutely. And here's the motto that I love. Food is our most intimate and profound connection with nature. Thank you. Me <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. And in addition to her cooking blog, Karen is Cooking, she also launched CrowdSource an innovative kitchenware brand for making fermented foods like sauerkraut, natural pickles, and kimchi in wide mouth mason jars. Um, and yep. CrowdSource encourages the DIY artisanal spirit by enabling home cooks to create gourmet, live cultured foods that are delicious, nutrition, and econ economical. So show us, let's see your little, let's yeah. see your little can, can I just take you me? everywhere to introduce me, Hannah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would love that. Here it is. Here it is. It sits on wide mouth mason jars, and it can fit on um, different sizes. Like, I've got some mustard going on here. So different size jars, mm -hmm. so long as it is wide mouth, it will fit. Yep. Cool. Well, yep. we'll talk a little bit more about how it works. Right. But first, why don't we reminisce about how we know each other? Yes, I, like I know. Oh, easy. my God. You know, so I think we launched our businesses about the same time, right, 2013, 14. Oh, you launched yours before. Well, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Because yeah. I remember buying starters from you before. And then I, I was trying to think the last time we saw each other in person was in Albuquerque, New yes. Mexico. And we had a dinner and Sandra Katz was there. 
it was so much fun. Yeah, that was camp. the New Mexico Fermentation Fest. Um, yeah, and like the, the people who found ago. it edible, edible, but edible um, Albuquerque. Yes. Or New Mexico, or yeah. Yeah, they were very, very nice. Yeah. Did we meet at Freestone Fermentation Festival in 2010 or? No, I've least... never been to Freestone. At least I don't remember. <laughs> it only had one. <laughs> And uh, and you totally shocked me in Albuquerque by busting out in Mandarin. That is so awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll Did have you to know our time. book is also published in characters. Oh my gosh. Awesome. So is, yeah, is it being it sold out like in, in, in China, in, in uh -huh. Taiwan? Yes, exactly. So it's in both traditional and simplified. Oh my gosh, congratulations. That's really great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Bringing kombucha back to the Far East. I know. They really need it there. <laughs> they, they yes. So Hi, Karen. Weird gut microbiome. Jeffrey says that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> great, great, great. Congratulations. I have to get, can I get it on Amazon? Your, your, I wonder, that's a good question. I think it's like $60 here in the U.S. just because it's coming from a foreign place. Sure. But you know, yeah, yeah. But I'll see if I can find the link. Well, just so that I can share it with my friends, not that I have many there, but I have some yeah, the in ones... Hong Kong so that I can just tell them, hey, you can order it there. Mm hmm Yeah. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, wonderful. Good. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so we go way back. We do. Yeah. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time to come here and talk from your expertise. Obviously, you're a master fermenter. Not only do you make the kombucha, but you have all these other lovely ferments you're making yeah. behind you. Yeah. So um, so why don't you just share a little bit, like, how how did crowdsource come about? Like, how, or let's start even further back. Mm -hmm. Why are you a fermenter? How I got you into fermentation? So, uh, so my background is, you know, I'm a classically trained chef. So I was, you know, in kitchen behind the line, da, 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 uh, working for hotel restaurants. And then and I was so exhausted from that, you know, 12 hour days. Um, when I came back to the States, um, I just needed to do something else, but stay in with food. So I went back to school and became a certified nutritionist. And it was during my nutritional studies that I got reconnected to fermented foods. I say reconnected because, you know, I grew up, uh, well, I was born in Hong Kong, but I grew up in Hawaii. And although my mom was a terrible cook, she knew how to ferment a few things. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I sort of had fermentation, you know, kind of in my space, if you will, but I just never knew what it was, nor appreciated it. So when I went back to school, and you know, um, I learned about fermentation, I mean, I think I got Sandra Katz's book when it first came out. And some of the people on that might know Sally Fallon, you know, Nourishing Traditions. So that's how I just started fermenting at home. And then finally, I'm just like, you know, uh, I'm a chef and I'm find, finding it challenging to make a vat of sauerkraut. Can we make it easier for people? So then I just took a very traditional design and shrank it down so that it fits onto mason jars. So then you can make a small batch. And then I didn't have... Um, you know, business savvy or money, but I did launch a Kickstarter, which became very successful. And that's how I got into the crowdsource fermentation space with a Kickstarter. So it was like people uh, standing up and saying, you know what, we want to ferment, you know, and crowdsource, you know, looks like a good idea. So that's basically what happened. And, you know, I've been in this well, since. And then how does the crowdsource work? And of course, if anyone has any questions for Karen, she is a fermentation expert. Yeah. We'd be happy to answer your questions about, like, I have a question already. Like, okay. it's so hot. How do we make sauerkraut in hot weather? Because that seems to be a challenge. Yeah, it um, is. It is. Um, definitely. So, you know, I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, um, you know, because our time here is short. Uh, if anybody has questions or want to join free webinars that I offer, you can go to our website, crowdsource.com and sign up for the newsletter. Or if you have any questions on fermentation, my um, email is Karen, K-A-R-E-N, at crowdsource.com. So you're always welcome to email me. It might take me a couple of days to respond, but I do, okay? <laughs> so to answer awesome. your question, Hannah, um, 
we can show how it works a little bit later, but to answer your question more relevant, how do you ferment in this um, extra hot weather? So the ideal temperature for lacto fermentation is between about 65 to, you can stretch it to 75. That's kind of like the happy range where uh, the majority of the microbes that are utilized in lacto fermentation like to thrive. That's when they really prolifer proliferate and they're happy. If you go to a cooler range, the fermentation time is just going to take longer. If you go to the hot, hot stage, like your kitchen right now could be 95 degrees. It could be, God forbid, 100, because global warming is upon us. In which case, what do you do? So think of it this way. Salt could be one factor. And I, I use Celtic sea salt a lot. I, I like to promote them just because I don't have anything related to them, but I like them. Um, so salt being the nature of salt is going to slow down the process of fermentation. So if you are in a very hot kitchen, don't be afraid to add in like an extra teaspoon of salt or even two teaspoons of salt to slow down the fermentation. And then the question comes up, people are like, oh, well, then my sauerkraut becomes too salty. That's okay. You can mix the sauerkraut with other vegetables, like in a salad, and still enjoy it. So having it a little salty, don't worry about it, because it's a condiment. Now, right, exactly. Yeah, if, having said that, if you don't want to add more salt, then just realize that your sauerkraut is going to mature a lot faster. So maybe instead of 10 days, it's going to be ready at five to six. You're just going to have to give it a try. But also recognize that um, the wonderful gamut of lactobacilli bacteria may not be like at its best, but, you know, um, anywhere between six to seven days, it is fermented. I, and I know that because I send in my samples to a lab to be tested. Okay. And like they came back with a panel and lo and behold, there were like two or three strains of the bacteria, the good bacteria that we're looking for. So because you're doing it in a small batch, as opposed to be a big bucket, the fermentation time is actually less. You mm -hmm. know, whereas if you have a big barrel, that's why in traditional recipes, they're like, oh, the sauerkraut won't be ready for like a month or two months. And, you know, us modern people are like, oh, two months, no way. <laughs> but if you're doing a small batch, like in a quart, you know, or even a, a pint, less time. So that's the other thing, too. I just realized something. Do it in a smaller batch. It'll ferment faster, and then you're done. <laughs> there you go. And then, yeah. so you talk about lactobacilli, yeah. and are you typically using a starter? Or are you just allowing the microbes from the skin of the cabbage or whatever you're yeah, fermenting? Yeah, you know, I love wild fermentation. You know, I just like things to happen naturally, but it entails several things. It means that you really want to get nice, fresh vegetables. You know, it is not true that because people ask me like, well, can I use this head of cabbage? And when they show me, it's really like gnarly and like <laughs> black. And then like, it's been my, in my refrigerator for a month. So I'm like, no. <laughs> so I know like fermentation is, you know, less waste and all of that. But still, if you want the most delicious sauerkraut, you do still have to start with, you know, a fairly fresh head of cabbage. So ideally, you know, if it's growing your garden or if you raid your neighbor's garden, that's the best. Cabbages close to the ground have the highest amount of lactobacilli um, uh, bacteria to, to jumpstart that fermentation. Organic, of course, is always good from your local farmer's market. But if you don't have the choice and you have to get a head of cabbage from like Safeway, it is still going to work. Um, so depending on the source, when you know that the source is fairly natural and good, you don't need a starter. But if it's questionable, then you can use a starter, although it's actually not always necessary. For myself, I found that when you do wild fermentation, let it go naturally in its progression, you end up with a more delicious product and it stays more crunchy. Whereas if you add in a starter, somehow something has been skipped and it's mm. still good and delicious, but the texture is just not, um, it's just like not fantastic. And this is after that like many minutes. Yeah, it just like doesn't have that sort of liveliness to it that I like. Um, but you know, I, I don't want to deter people from trying both ways. Well, so if you were to use a starter, are you typically thinking of like the packets of powder starter or do you like to backslop from a previous Yeah, I've, batch? I've done backslop. Um, actually, what I found really is there are a couple of brands of probiotic capsules 
Mm. And I did make a fantastic batch using one specific probiotic capsule. So you can what, also do that too. What was too. the organism? Um, you know what? I'm going to have to look at the... the oh, that's fine. Yeah, but I can definitely share it with people. I don't want to take the time now. But, you know, if you guys are interested yeah. in the brand, I'll share it. Because the guy who founded that brand, he is a microbiologist. He's fantastic, you know. And, and so I, and I also met him at a um, nutritional conference, you know. So I was experimenting and I'm like, let's try this, you know. Um, and it was like really, really good. So you can also have that option. But of course, you can also purchase something online if you want to give that a try or backstopping. Or you can even use whey. Yeah, exactly. Using whey is great, especially for the fruit ferments where fermentation time needs to be less. Because mm -hmm. some fruits, depending on the level of sugar, it can very quickly turn into alcohol. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's still good, but not, you know, what you but want. I mean, I have the intended flavor profile, exactly. right? Because exactly. you're not always wanting to have that boozy fermentation. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, yeah, let's talk about some of the other things we can ferment. Obviously, yeah. we all know sauerkraut is cabbage, mm -hmm. and we can put all kinds of amendments in there. Yeah, so know, I have this one. Um, and just so you guys, uh, there is a webinar that I did specifically on fermenting mustard, so you can find that on my mm -hmm. website. So here we are. We just like uh, organic mustard seeds. There are um, cloves of garlic. I put um, onions in there, too, because, like, the mustard seeds would not have the proper bacteria. So I throw in some uh, mm. raw ingredients, vegetables. And this has been sitting here in this jar for, um, I kid you not, almost three months, because I was just like too lazy to get around to it. <laughs> so, so because of this thing with you, I'm like, oh, I better do something with this jar. <laughs> but as you can see, it's still, it's still totally fine. Like it's a little dark here, but no problem. Like nothing, there's no mold, nothing growing here. And I'm just gonna throw it into a high speed blender, blend it, throw in some honey to adjust the, the flavoring, throw in some spices, and I have my own lacto-fermented mustard, live culture mustard. Yeah. Yeah, we have a recipe for using kombucha to make kombucha mustard. Oh, so cool. I love that. Yeah, is that online? Yeah. I'm going to try that. That is so cool. It's not online. It's in the big book. Okay, um, all right, cool. But we have a, several condiment recipes, yeah. kombucha, mustard, nice. um, a barbecue sauce, nice. a teriyaki sauce. Yeah, yeah. Um, even a banana ketchup from the Philippines. I just had so much fun researching okay. recipes for the book. I just loved how clever that concept was yeah. when there was a dearth of tomatoes and yeah. people just got creative. So, nice. um, See, that's, that's so, the power of fermentation. You know, whether it's using kombucha or wild fermentation, there's just like the, the, the possibilities are endless. You know, once people get comfortable with it, so, yeah, so the well, other now's thing, the time to be fermenting because everything's yeah. in season. I know. So the other thing, now this is, this is a, a variation of crowdsource that I started, um, also another Kickstarter. It fits onto a French-made jar, but I don't know if people can see. I've got blueberries fermenting in here mm, with rosebuds and cinnamon. <laughs> this is like one of my favorite, favorite fruit ferments because blueberries are so easy to ferment. You just make like a, a salt brine. Pour it over the blueberries, let it ferment for about seven to 10 days. And you've got this really interesting, like blueberry, mildly sweet, salty blueberry that tastes like a cross between blueberries and olives. Ooh. And you don't have to, like, it's just so good. And then you can use the brine because it's this pretty, like purple color for cocktails mm -hmm. <laughs> or add it to kombucha to make like a, a, a healthy cocktail. And then the blueberries yes. are so awesome. Like I just toss it into a salad or I pop it in. And it's a great way to preserve blueberries. Anna, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, you know, okay. We were <laughs> Every once in a while it happens. I know, I'm it's like, okay. <laughs> so anyway, I was just saying that with the blueberries, you know, instead of turning it into a jam, which is great, but there's a lot of work into making jam and there's all and there's that lot sugar. sugar. So when you use a salt brine, you know, you're gonna get probiotics, you get to preserve your blueberries if you're lucky enough to have a blueberry patch. Um, or you just buy some and then you can enjoy it through the season when there's no um, blueberries available. And I'm personally eating a lot of blueberries because like I've always had bad eyes. <laughs> it's not getting any better, you know, all this computer time. So I'm just like 
chomping down the blueberries right now, fresh and preserved. You know, I love it. blueberries too. They're so high in anthocyanins. And yes. That gives them that beautiful yeah. color. They're the main um, ingredient in my love potion 99 kombucha, nice. which is blueberry, lavender, nice. rose. Yeah. And then yeah. Um, my acid actually has improved and worsened at the same time. So like I now need the, you know, the far, the, my yeah. type, but <laughs> somehow it, it's improved as well. So I don't know if that's all my blueberries. Yeah, I know, just... I know. I mean, um, you know, I don't know if uh, people are familiar with um, uh, Gladstar. What's her name? Mary, Mary Rosemary Gladstar, Rosemary. the legendary yes. herbalist. I mean, I have one of her books and that's what she said. She's like blueberries. <laughs> so, you know, and she's, she's fantastic. I mean, I don't know how old she is, but she looks great and she's still like very active. So much energy. I was really lucky to meet her while on book tour because cool. we're, we're, we have the same publisher for yeah. some of the books and yeah. um, she's just a lovely person, human yeah. being, so passionate about what she does. Yeah. And, you know, herbs are a great thing we can put into our ferments Absolutely. to get that extra nutritional boost as well as a flavor yep. bump. We did have a question though. Someone was asking yep. about keeping their asparagus from getting too mushy. Oh, you know what? I um, actually people don't like mushy have that problem. So, so one of the things that you can add to your asparagus, if it turns out mushy, one, it could be that you're not using enough salt in your brine. So I, I advocate about five grams of salt to one cup of water for this type of fermentation. So five grams. That's 5%? No, that's actually just a 2%. Yeah, five percent. Oh, okay, so two percent yeah. brine, so five, five grams per one cup. Yeah, okay. so for those of you who don't have like a super fine scale, five grams is about if you take like a fairly fine salt, you know, not not super chunky, but not super fine, kind of middle middle ground, kind of like this. I know it's hard for people to see, but then it's just one teaspoon, level the teaspoon, and then dissolve it in one cup of water, then you're gonna get your two percent brine. Okay. Okay. So the other thing too is, um, if you really love asparagus and you really don't want it to go wrong, tannin. Adding in a little bit of tannin to your ferment is going okay. to help because that is the secret for making perky pickles. You need to add in tannin. Um, so I, tannin I you can get from hmm? grape leaves. Yes, yeah, so from grape leaves, from horseradish root. Uh, some people have used uh, raspberry leaves. Yeah, I was going to say raspberry. How about strawberry leaves? Do you think they would? You could try. The same I've never done it. My personal yes. preference is actually tea because I'm also like a tea geek. So loose yeah. leaf tea, organic, if possible. You don't need a lot. You know, let's say for one quart like this, just about um, a tablespoon, like no a more. Oh, a tablespoon. A tablespoon, a tablespoon. Yeah, because depending oh. on the tea, that's why I say that. But what happens is when you use the tea into your salt brine. And when it's done, the brine actually also tastes delicious because you have that overture of the tea and you can like do shots of the tea, which I do. So then you do like a black tea then because it's well, iron. So tannin. black tea is not going to be the most attractive looking because the black tea is going to turn. We always want to right hand Good point. That. So black tea is going to turn your brine all dark, which doesn't hurt. I mean, there's nothing wrong. Right. But I personally would, would use a white tea or a green tea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You, you, can see, you can see color. the brine, you can see what you're doing, and you don't get this all dark thing there, you know. Another question is, would bay leaf work as tannin? Not enough. Not but, enough. Yeah, there's okay. a little bit of tannin, and plus, if you put in too many leaves, it's going to taste so strong, it's not going to be right. palatable. So you could do one and some mm -hmm. tea leaves, but I wouldn't use exclusively bay leaves. Okay. Yeah. That's a good tip to know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. Crunchy, people love the crunchy pickles. Yeah. And that, that's always the, like, challenge between the vinegar pickle and the lacto pickle. Like, right. How do you get that lacto pickle to be as crisp yeah. as that vinegar pickle? Again, I, I have a video ex especially on how to make crunchy pickles on my website, mm -hmm. crowdsource.com. So you guys can go there and just access it. Or you can always email me, you know. Or we have yes. a recipe and on the website. Yeah, there's a couple of secrets. Great. You know, but uh, it's all revealed. <laughs> the secrets from the master fermenters shall be revealed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's because we didn't have our grandmas teaching us this. So now we're, know, we're, being, we're the grandmas. I know. Isn't that true? Like, I know, like I said, my mom was a terrible cook. And unfortunately, I never met my grandmother. So I didn't get that ancestral wisdom. But, um, but now here we have it, you know. The microbes, yeah. the microbes know where to find people who are going to help them. 
Exactly right. Yeah. And so would this, would this principle of making things crunchy also apply to something as soft or watery as like tomatoes or is that just No, you know what, um, tomatoes you are green tomatoes maybe. Yeah, you know, you could definitely try it, but because tomatoes are so porous, there's just like so much water in it. With tomatoes, if you have them like tiny and whole, it could work. Um, but if the skin is kept on, I feel that you don't really even need it. You know, you just, again, want to use a higher salt concentration. And I definitely, um, you know, I've made fermented salsa, but the tomatoes are chopped up and it's a short ferment. And that's one recipe where, you know, theoretically tomatoes are fruits, where I do add in whey because it's a short ferment. It's like three to four days. But then afterwards, that salsa that's lacto fermented can actually last a lot longer in your refrigerator than conventional salsa. And it just sort of improves in taste. You know, it's not going to last forever because, again, tomatoes are fragile. So, but it'll last like up to three, four weeks. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Especially in summer. Hopefully in summer, we're just plowing yeah, right through that. Yeah, on. I know. I mean, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you can put salsa on, on anything, you know, really. You can. It's yeah. so delicious. And again, it's that condiment, right? Mm -hmm. So I think yep. the, the thing to remember about the fermented foods and drinks is yeah. we drink them as tonics. We drink them as condiments. Right. Because in these small doses, that's where they're most effective. Yeah. Sometimes if we yeah. overconsume so over <laughs> yeah. in cleanse situations. I know. That's why people are like, oh, you know, I... I ate some sauerkraut. I don't feel so well. And I'm like, well, how much did you eat? Oh, I ate the whole pint. And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> it's not your salad. It's no, an it's addition the to the salad. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up because as a condiment, though, is the consistency. You know, it's no different than taking like a really high end vitamin. You're not going to try mm. and take the whole bottle in one day. Right? Right. You're going to take like two capsules, whatever the bottle says, but you're going to take it consistently day after day after day. You might yeah. skip a day or two. That's fine, but it's consistency. So for my end, like I'm drinking kombucha, you know, I'm drinking kefir. I eat yogurt. I do, you know, all the sauerkraut, but I'm doing it consistently in small doses. Yeah, exactly right. And, you know, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on sort of, you know, there's a sort of definition for probiotic that's being pushed, I think, yes. by a more Berman. supplement or pharmaceutical type yes. industry. Mm -hmm. where it has to survive through the gut acids right. and this and that. And I just, I really am challenged by that definition because yeah. I feel like it dismisses the benefits of fermented foods and the fact that even if that those exact strains don't live in the gut, they rupture and that DNA is absorbed into your gut. And there's, there's a lot of benefits from having that DNA present that other organisms yep. can then pick up. Yeah. I was just curious what your thoughts are. On yeah. That. Uh, so very, very topical right now. And so timely because um, I, I think you're a member of the fermentation association or you've seen their webinars. And so uh, the webinar that I did, uh, sit in on, you know, was by two microbiologists, professors at, I think, University of Nebraska and another university. So they were really geeking out on the technical definition of what probiotic is. And I totally, totally respect that. You know, they're like, it has to be strains that have proven to have health benefits to a study. But then now we're trying to narrow things again and trying to like, by codify it and 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 force it to be in a space where you know bacteria is so wide ranging you know there's like unseen bacteria like roaming around you and me right now <laughs> and there's unidentified bacteria yes, and you exactly. don't even know what they exactly. do so just <laughs> the so, notion that we have to have a pharmaceutical trial to prove yeah. that something's effective when human beings have been utilizing this technology yeah. for since the dawn of time or time immemorial I know. feels really frustrating yeah, to me. It's very I find yeah, it's very confining. Yeah. Like, you know, as a nutritionist, I, I respect that line of research because definitely I call a lot of data from such research to validate my points, but at the same time, it's really narrowing it. So I really feel like, you know, uh, people who are in fermentation and all of you guys, if you've done fermentation or not, that includes you too. We, if you start fermenting, and kind of give up that idea of trying to control, 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 and let the wisdom of the wild bacteria do its job. It's going to serve you in terms of health. And I would say for myself, it's even served uh, served me spiritually. Like I see a better view of the world, 
you know, in terms of the environment, my relationship with people, with the community. And, um, and listen, these microorganisms have been here since we started, like billions of years ago. And if they are in our gut <laughs> and they're surviving in our gut, on our, on our eyelashes everywhere, and they're surviving, that says something about a lot that we don't know. Well, and I think yeah. the other thing is then what you do is you narrow it so much and now everybody's consuming the same probiotic exactly. that and then, now you're monoculturing right. as opposed to getting the diverse range of organisms. Totally so I think agree. that's the other yeah. unintended consequence that can happen is that totally. people just end up with the same probiotics. Exactly. And that's why I always look. Yeah. Like if it says there's probiotics, yeah. I always look. What strain is it? Yep. Oh, well, I've already had that strain in something else. I'm not going to then have it in my chips or have it right because exactly. it's in everything right yeah. now. And in honest truth, in terms of supplement and foods that are highly processed, they claim that there are those strains in there, but <laughs> I mean, are you going to look under a microscope? I mean, you could, I guess, if you had a really, you know, sophisticated one, but I certainly am not, you know, so, and, and I, I really think, um, you know, there's a lot of wisdom there and we just kind of have to let go, you know, and, and trust that this method, which has been proven very, very safe. And as you know, um, Sandra Katz repeatedly says, you know, there's never been anyone seriously, fatally harmed by a bad batch of sauerkraut, <laughs> okay? But there have exactly. been people seriously harmed by uh, industrialized food. Correct. And that's Correct. why we have yeah. to recalibrate, you know, and just think about this. Yeah. Well, and I think that, you know, his, my favorite book of his, and I don't even know if it's in print anymore, mm -hmm. is The Revolution Will Not Be Microwave. Yes, thank you. I have that. <laughs> I have that. Well, that's one of my favorite books. <laughs> so and, Because he just clearly lays out how, yeah. you know, when when we shifted, and again, Sally Fallon and, yeah. and uh, Justin Price's work looks at yeah. this very specifically, like when we shifted to this very refined diet, yeah. we ended up you know, and even Michael Pollan and Omnivore's Dilemma talks yeah. about this, right? Yeah. How we end up actually only consuming wheat, corn, and soy yeah. in various derivations. Yeah. And that's not what nature intended for us. And yeah. so it, it can be a challenge to break free from processed foods. Yeah. But I feel like every extreme dietary out there, right, whether it's vegan or keto or paleo, whatever it is, the reason it works is because it gets you off the processed foods. Yep, exactly. Now, whether or not it's exactly. the diet you should use to sustain your life forever, I think there's some question there because I think we need more of a balance of nutrients. And, again, trusting your gut yep. and listening to your body when it says, hey, I'm craving X, Y, or Z. Um, Absolutely. And, and you know, it, back, it's back it's to that important. point about the definition for probiotic, you know, that's what industry wants to do. They want to narrow, narrow, narrow. But in reality, you know, because we, we, we have a lot of issues right now, you know, climate collapse, pandemics, etc. And the real truth is, like, diversity is resilience. You know, yes. I mean, a very simple fact is, you know, look what happened to Ireland and one strain of potato. When that one strain of potato could not be grown as a crop anymore, look what happened. I mean, I know I'm simplifying it, but it illustrates the point, you know. If they had had, like, still thousands of varieties of potatoes, they perhaps may not have had that emergency. <laughs> we look at how they grow potatoes in the Andes, right? They yeah. have several strains together, yeah. and if one fails, others thrive. Yeah. So that even if pests do yeah. invade, yeah. because they can do that, yeah. they still have this protection because they're not monocropping. And exactly. I really feel like mono anything I know. is anti because yeah. we never see anything in nature that's mono. Oh, no, no. Like everything is in an ecosystem. Everything's a web of life. Exactly. And um, I know some folks are asking about fermenting dried fruit, which we'll get to in a moment. Okay, but I just yes, felt like okay. this conversation <laughs> yeah. is so important because I think it's, you know, I think what happens when we narrow is also then we patent and we trademark yes. and we make it so that other people can't. It becomes do like this money. Thing. Like money. <laughs> well, and we shouldn't be trying to trademark nature, right? No, like nature is no. diverse and she is beautiful and yeah. we need all the iterations yeah. because we are all unique. Like the organisms I need that make me happy may be very different from yours, exactly. right? My ancestors yeah. weren't from China. My right. ancestors were from Northern Europe. Right. And so I think the more that we tune in mm -hmm. to the wisdom, the yep. DNA wisdom, we have billions of years of information codified within our bodies. Yep, absolutely. We need to come back to listening to that yeah. and looking at what those foods were and how those people ate. That's a great starting point. Like if you're confused about what to eat, the more you know about your heritage, like go to those foods, right. go to those traditions first yeah. and just see what feels good to you yeah and then just just eat what's available locally too you know we don't need to 
you know, buy strawberries from Chile in December, yeah. you know, um, right. it's just, it's just not good anyway. Um, so no, I totally agree. And again, you know, really, like, I, I think of the gut microbiome as the soil on which we thrive, right? So just like that monocropping example that you just gave, which is great, because it's like, the soil is depleted, you're only growing one or two crops, there's no diversity there. So it's the same thing, your microbiome, and there's no nutrients. Hello, yay, um, technical issues, always fun when we're live. All right. We're back. Hi, I can adjust my phone a little bit. Um, we were having such a lively conversation. I know, I know. Sorry, everyone. Um, you know, I don't know. But anyway, the conversation continues. <laughs> Indeed. I think we were both um, yeah. extolling the virtues of traditional fermentation, of wild fermentation, yes. and yes. Uh, bemoaning the push towards, um, you know, single strain or just a few strains. And yes just that yeah. impact on our bodies. And so definitely, um, you know, eat all the things, ferment all the things. And so why don't we, why don't we jump over to the conversation about um, fermenting dried fruit? Um, yes, yeah, I definitely want to address when, that question. Yeah. So yes, fermenting dried fruit, you can absolutely do it. However, recognize that dry fruit has a ton, a ton, a ton of sugar. Okay, so um, I have added dry fruits like raisins or apricots or even dates, but in small, small amounts in comparison to the rest of your ingredients. So for instance, like adding in, um, let's say, um, a third cup of raisins to um, a purple cabbage to make it purple sauerkraut with the raisins is really, really lovely. And then you can add in like, some cayenne pepper or chili pepper. So incorporating dry fruits uh, into a vegetable permanent is the way to, to go. Um, so you can do that, but if you try to ferment like a whole batch of raisins or a big jar of apricots that are dry, what you end up with is just alcohol, if it's even successful. So yeah. Yeah. So I, well, hope I think someone was bringing up the umabashi plums, which are really salty and also sour. So I wonder yeah. if that just creates a different flavor profile. Oh yeah, yeah, so yeah, definitely that um, you can do. Um, you can add in a little bit of that. Um, I've also added in like jujubes, you know, in, um, in Chinese uh, medicine, jujubes are great. But then again, adding in um, a controlled amount in comparison to the raw vegetables, because the vegetables are gonna give you that lactic acid bacteria to jumpstart your ferment. Um, and so, yeah, that's how I would approach it. Yeah, and presumably the sugar and the dried fruit will also be a food source for those organisms. But to your point, it will also feed the yeast, and that could lead to yes. a very boozy flavor profile, which is not right. what we're exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know. Um, and in my experience, when that type of ferment goes boozy, it's just not particularly pleasant. It's not right. like, oh, I'm going to make some kind of fantastic alcohol. You know, <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> I mean, you could, but I, I would say, um, yeah, just just bear in mind, don't. Don't put too much sugar in. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what I really love, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier, is taking the brine and making cocktails out mm -hmm. of it. Because yep. we, um, yep. you know, when we support our liver, we're able to process alcohol more easily. Plus, it gives a delicious flavor pro yeah. profile. So, for example, I love like yeah. a beet kvass martini. Yeah. It just has that like earthy flavor profile. You get a little pink mustache. Right. It's so good. Yeah, yeah. See, the crows like it too, where you are. <laughs> and then it also adds in that little touch of salt, which is like a secret ingredient to carry all of the flavors, you know, because even, you know, I, I also do consultation for um, a gluten-free bakery, and I'm always creating recipes, but, you know, those are unfortunately mainly sugar-based, but when you add in that little pinch of salt, it just brings all of the flavors together. And, you know, so the same thing with adding the brine. But, you know, if you're not into cocktails, like Hannah and I are, obviously, you can just drink shots of it. You know, it replenishes your electrolytes. If you are an athlete, it gives you the great probiotics that are still in 
that mm -hmm. brine and it just sort of um yeah it um when i have eaten like too much junky things or whatever over the holidays i do a little it's shot of brine and it just like recalibrates you know because you have that salt you have the probiotics you have the electrolytes yeah <laughs> i've definitely accidentally overdone it with the brine especially when i was on the road I was really thirsty and I found a bottle of kraut juice. I was like, this is so good. And then a little while later, I was like, wow, this has really just <laughs> gone through me. <laughs> so even an experienced fermenter can accidentally overdo it, yes. is my point. So if you yeah. do, just, you know, pay attention to that in the future. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, if you ever feel uncomfortable from a ferment, really just dialing back the amount you're consuming, increasing your water yeah, consumption totally. is really helpful because you're just going to help to flush that out. And again, as you said before, nobody's ever been harmed by a bad batch of, of sauerkraut. Um, you know, I think that it, it can be uncomfortable, but it doesn't mean it's likely going to create any sort of issue long term. Right, exactly. And it could be that, you know, um, depending on your gut microbiome, it just means that something's happening there. Something's trying to reestablish balance, you know, especially for those of you who are maybe, um, you know, experimenting now coming into fermentation from a space where you, you were not eating, or let's just put it engaged in the healthiest diet, you know, <laughs> um, where you were eating a lot of processed food. So when you introduce um, the microbes from the, the kombucha or a batch of sauerkraut, there's going to be a little bit of a tension going on there in your gut. Right. So just kind of honor that, you know, see how you're feeling. Like Hannah said, you might have to dial it back. Um, or are you just going to say, okay, you know what? I'm, I know how this feels. So I'm just going to kind of maintain this for the next few days and see what happens, you know? Well, and yeah. another rookie mistake can be sometimes you're like, oh, I'm supposed to get fermented foods. I've got sauerkraut and kombucha and kefir. And like, you just add all of these different ferments at once and you just sort of, assault yeah. your gut and may not be ready for it so like add right. one then when that's stabilized yeah. add another right so we just sort of yes, want to exactly. layer those on good point good point because you know you don't want to you don't want to have too many actors on the stage <laughs> exactly right yeah yeah but everybody put it in the world. um someone is asking like yeah. what do you recommend for those who seem to react to fermented things like sauerkraut the first thing i would say right now is just make sure you don't have a histamine allergy because while fermented foods are yes. fantastic yeah. For everybody to consume, there are there are people who have an al allergic reaction to the histamines created by the fermentation process, and that means you need to repair your gut before you can add those back in. So if you're struggling with yes. sauerkraut and other ferments and finding they're actually making you not feel so great, you just want to connect with your primary care physician and figure out what's going on underneath that and at least eliminate that as an option before um, trying to force different ferments to make you feel better. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, so if there's a lot of gut issues going on, the first thing that you really need to think about is what foods are causing that discomfort. You know, for a lot of people, it could be uh, gluten, it could be corn, it could be soy, all these allergens that we're surrounded by that's like actually hidden, you know, in food. So yeah, the first thing is to identify uh, what's causing the digestive upset. And then um, specific to, I think, Janine, who asked the question, um, you know, it could be that there's something in the cabbage that doesn't agree with you. We never know, right. like what we were just talking about. So you could try doing maybe some pickles, you know, and adding, eating a little bit or some other vegetables like asparagus, asparagus. you know, asparagus. try those mm -hmm. in small amounts. And if they, if you're reacting to them in the same way, then it could be very likely of what Hannah just said, the histamine reaction. And then, so in that case, you, just, you have to step back and, and figure out what's going on first, you know, or well, you for some the, people, it could be the, um, a little bit of goat yogurt would be better than sauerkraut. So, right. I, I always yeah. say, so people ask, what's your next favorite ferment besides kombucha? And I always say milk kefir, because I feel like um, the milk yeah. kefir kefir um, just right. is so mm -hmm. nutritious. And it's because yep. it's processing the lactose, even folks who are lactose yeah. intolerant can often enjoy it. Absolutely. Of course, if you have that case in allergy, you're going to want to avoid all dairy, but um, right. But I just feel like that one is so nutritious and it's really versatile. And yes, yeah. it has a little yeah. bit of that sour flavor, but you can put it in a smoothie with some strawberries or some fruits and really lively it up and your body quickly really enjoys that flavor and starts to crave it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, always like when the body is like whatever is bio identical or biocompatible, you know, so I 
um, I just always advocate as a nutritionist, like if you are eating healthy food, take that nutrient from food over a supplement because supplements, um, they have their place certainly, but yes. you know, for people with digestive issues, the capsule itself, the capsule, the container material can be problematic. You know, um, the, the source of the ingredients are problematic sometimes, really hard to digest for people. So as much as you can get it from food, and if you are really challenged, then work with a good um, holistic practitioner to, to, to figure it out first, you know. Um, and then I, I used to uh, work with a lot of people who had candida. You know, and candida is the classic one where people are like, oh, no, don't eat any fermented foods. It's going to feed the candida. Um, probably 10% of the case, that's true. For, but for the 90%, it's just really tweaking the food that they're eating. You know, I'm yeah. really tapping into the body and say, what does my digestion require at this time? And when more likely than not, um, yeah, more because likely than not, the little bit of kombucha, sauerkraut is good. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. And, and, you know, with the candida, it's remembering that it's a pat, it's an opportunistic pathogen. Like our bodies need yeah. candida. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is yeah. when it gets out of balance. And that's the problem with everything, right? Absolutely. The, the thing that causes illness yeah. is stress. Stress can manifest in a variety right. of ways. And being out of balance yes. is always going to cause stress. Um, and so yes. you're right. A lot of times consuming kombucha and other fermented foods, it's going to have a reaction though. Like your body, like you said, there's going to be tension and there's going to be a little bit yeah. of a battle going on. So you might not feel perfectly right. well the first time you start to yeah. introduce those yeah. foods. Over time, yeah. they gradually are going to push those opportunistic pathogens back into a balance that's healthier for your body. And so when I say trust your gut, like a lot of times people are like, oh, but I'm craving sugar because of candida. I'm like, yes, but you got to listen to the biofeedback loop. So trust yes. your gut isn't just yeah. like, I'm going to do what my taste buds tell me is delicious or this or that. But it's like, once you consume that food, how does it then make you feel? And I feel like kombucha and other That's fermented right. foods, especially on an empty stomach, can really help us quickly feel into what it's like to consume those foods. And that way, when we consume mm -hmm. anything, we start to connect that together. So for example, you know, a lot of fast food is off my list. Like it just, I haven't had it in yeah. decades. But there are certain things, yeah. and if they're using a certain type of oil, like the, you know, the the seed oils or whatever, yeah, I'll have a bit like cotton seed oil, and not even, you know, like the the rapeseed, yeah. the canolas, the right. <laughs> yeah, really yeah, classic stuff out there, and my body will have a reaction. And so over time, you start to learn what your body responds to, and then you make yeah. a judgment. Is it, mm -hmm. do I want that fast food anyways? And I understand the results it's going to have on my body. And I'm going to go into that mm -hmm. with a conscious mind and make that conscious decision. Or am I just putting things in my body and not connecting that it's the food that's making me feel terrible. And I just wanted to say earlier about the gluten and things is people will go to other countries where glyphosate is not the dominant pesticide and they are able to consume gluten. They're able to consume these products. Yes, because I they totally agree. Yep. Poison. Right? You think about yeah. a pesticide, yeah. its whole job is to kill things, and now you put that in your gut. What's it doing? It's killing the things in your gut so you can't function properly. And that's why it's so yeah. crucial Absolutely. that we're aware of the types of foods, the sourcing of the foods we're putting in our body so that, you know, really thinking about this isn't just a car engine. This is a temple. This is a sacred organism. This is a, this is a whole ecosystem. And if you want it to... Um, vibrate and resonate at its highest levels, you have to be very conscientious about what you're putting in your body. And I know some people will say, but I can't afford this or that, but there's actually a lot of like, go to the farmer's market at the end. And a lot of times they're just trying to get rid of the extra stuff and you'll get a discount. So there are actually yes. little tricks. And yeah. I was there. I was there at the end of the day yesterday. I got my blueberries cheap. <laughs> There at the end of the day, or even a small garden, like anyone can put a couple containers on a windowsill. So um, yeah. it's at least a start, right? It's at least a start. Yeah. And I think the more awareness yeah. we have around. Exactly. It's like recalibrating, you know, our whole um, relationship with food, you know, and where it comes from and, you know, all of that. But yeah, I, I, I totally feel like, you know, now it's actually more relevant than ever. Because like in terms of people like saying, well, I can't afford it, but you know, your health is primary, especially now. 
And so, you know, yeah. I like I don't I don't go to XYZ coffee to get my latte drink, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That four or five bucks, I'm gonna go and buy a pint of organic blueberries that's grown locally, you know. So it's like where you make your choice. I can be decent coffee at home. You know, I don't need to go to right, right. um these you know, these places. So it's like it's hard, you know, you're gonna make your decisions, but you know, ultimately the food is so critical. And I think what's so frustrating to me and what I think is incredibly immoral is that you have these large food conglomerates that make food without the pesticides, without the toxins, because they're not permitted to in Europe and other places, but then they sell the yeah. toxic stuff to us because they can get away with it. And that to me is just so revolting of a concept. Like, <laughs> why <laughs> do you even think that that's a better way to do things? Why wouldn't you simply adopt the healthier choice I get it. It's all about right. profit. And that's the, that's the frustrating yeah. thing about it is there isn't a care for the citizenry in this country. I know. It's all about I profit. Know. And we're just viewed as like things to be taken from. And they have these very parasitic yeah. practices. And it I think the indeed. more we shine yeah. a light and the more we bring that to their attention and the more that we vote with our dollars, um, you know, the more we're going to send a message that, hey, we're not, we're not going to tolerate being poisoned anymore. And I really yeah. think that anybody – anywhere can start a fermented foods business and help their community. Now I'm not saying you're oh, going to be a billionaire off of that or even a billionaire, no. but if you care about community, if you care about it, it's such a low barrier to entry. It's so easy. These foods are incredibly safe to make that anyone can work with their local farmers or be that farmer, make their fermented foods, sell them to their communities and that community benefits as a result. And so Absolutely. anyone who's feeling Absolutely passionate about making these changes i think that's a really simple way that you can a lot of them will even you can even do them under a cottage food license now you might quickly find that doesn't allow for enough uh, opportunity to profit and so you want to go to a shared kitchen space but yeah. i really think there's a lot of opportunity for folks um, to have that kind of side business um, that could turn into a full-time business because it's also going to support mm -hmm. their community yeah absolutely yeah and for, for those of you who are like looking at sauerkraut or pickles you're more than welcome to email me. Um, again, my, my email is Karen, K-A-R-E-N, at krautsource.com. I actually put out a fermented um, spread a few years ago, um, and I funded it on Kickstarter, just like I did Krautsource. But at the end of the day, it was so labor intensive. It wasn't viable for me, but I learned a lot. I was in a shared uh, kitchen space. I had to get my licensing and everything. So the whole thing was um, definitely a huge learning curve. Um, you know, so, and, and the thing is like, you know, if you're not going to try doing it now, then when? And and like Hannah said, you know, it's, it's going to benefit the community. You may lose or gain financially. It's uncertain for sure. We don't want to like romanticize it for you, but it's going to have a shift for sure. Because like I personally, yes, I need to make money. You know, I, I need to maintain a certain comfort of life spot, but I do not nor do I intend to be a billionaire. Like, I do not aspire to be Jeff Bezos. That is just not necessary. I aspire to be like, you know, to support my local community, you know, to, to have a comfortable life. But I don't need like billions and billions. You know, what am I, you know, unless I, I give it away and benefit people, but still it's like that constant driving and, and that, oh, that like angst to become like a multimillionaire is not necessary. Well, it's the you know, myth of so. the American dream, right? Like there's this mythology yeah. that that's what we all aspire to be. And I think that right. myth is held right. in place to keep people constantly running that rat race. And um, I think yes, what we've exactly. seen, the, some yeah. of the, the blessings out of the pandemic is this idea that I don't have to go into an office. I can be just as productive right. in my own space, yeah. managing my own time, taking breaks when I need them, as opposed to being forced into this sort of right. eight hours plus your commute plus, right? And I'm really excited to see that change and transformation because we really need to mm -hmm. um be more free and be, be more understanding that this isn't uh, the best, you know, we had to fight just to get down to an eight hour day, 40 hour work week. Maybe it's time for us I to know, transform that <laughs> since we're, you know, shipping yeah, away. It's, it's not going to be a sin. It won't be a sin if you don't work eight hours. You know? But Hannah, you know what? Um, we feel that you are culture, we feel so guilty.
Yes, go ahead. I know, I know. But <laughs> but you know what? Um, there was a question, Hannah. I don't know if you saw it. And it's, it's you you would be the right person to answer it. There was a about question the about the SCOBY. Yeah, the a, a person can tell. Yeah. They're not developed yet. There are no easy tests. And so we have to use our senses. And so when I'm looking at a SCOBY, the way that I test its strength, um, first of all, is, you know, how's it fermenting? But I squeeze mm -hmm. it. I pinch it. It's the pinch test. And so if I pinch it and my <laughs> thumb and forefinger do not break the SCOBY, that's a healthy, okay. resilient culture. Um, nice. And so, okay. but if it breaks easily or breaks apart easily, that's weak culture. And so that's culture we want to compost. That's culture we want to let go. Um, in terms of milk okay. kefir grains, um, and I would love to hear your input on this as well. Like, I mean, the, the thing is, if you... If you work with dehydrated grains, I found they don't tend to reproduce very much, but they will make you milk kefir. Um, and also, mm -hmm. I find that like if you want them to reproduce versus you want to make milk kefir, it's kind of two different processes. So if you're trying to increase the amount of kefir grains you want, you want to just keep refreshing that milk every 24 hours, even if the kefir isn't to the flavor profile you like. Or if you're just maintaining, just ferment for a couple days, do the straining, and they'll even continue to grow at that pace as well. But there's sort of two different things going on. And so as long as they do, they are pink, yeah. like pink is the color of no good when it comes to milk yeah. kefir. They can be slightly yellow. Yeah. I mean, you don't want them too yellow because if they get too yellow, something has died off, like it's been over fermented or it's been too warm. Um, and I don't know what your mm -hmm. experience is there, but that's that's my experience with them. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, I, I love that pinch test and I do the same. I'm not keeping any milk kefir right now because they're, they're, they're so fast growing and I just can't consume as much. So I gave mine to someone else because I didn't want to kill those. You know? I, I do keep water kefir um, uh, and I mix it with a batch that I got from you. And I've been going that, I've been doing it like very consistently. And honestly, they are so hardy. Like I've had a couple of batches where I forgot. Like I went away and came back two weeks later and I'm like, oh my God, I don't think anything's happening there. So what I do is I pour things out I touch it a little bit, they still seem fine. I quickly add in like a higher concentration of sugar to just like quickly revive them. And then I just kind of let them be and they're fine. You know, so long as when you make your, your batch, like a second fermentation, and when you, when you see that there are little tiny bubbles sometimes, or when you flip it open and there's like that whoosh, then you know like, okay, they're, they're back, they're okay. <laughs> but if things are well, just like very still and there's no motion, then maybe you need a fresh batch, you know? Well, and they, they are hardier than we realize, but I also think there's yeah. impatience because the flavor profile of yeah. Waterkeeper is definitely sweeter. And so I think, yeah. especially if you're a kombucha person coming to Waterkeeper, you're gonna be like, it just tastes like sugar water. It has right. fermented, it just may not have yeah. that flavor profile you like. So I personally have yeah. to let it bottle age for a really long time yeah. before it gets yeah. to the profile I that works for me. But another great way to yeah. do, take your sour kombucha and your water keeper, mix them together, and now you have this, this combo platter where you've got the sweetness of the water keeper with the sourness of the kombucha, nice. and you're just balancing out the flavor profiles. And I would love yeah, to sit I, here and talk with you all day long, but we too. probably both have to go. But I want us to talk yes. about crowdsourcing because we are going to do a giveaway, and I want people to yeah. see how it works and um, and then tell them about the and giveaway so you, and where we can find you. So you know what? I, I haven't even conceptualized the entire thing in my mind, so I apologize. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so so um, the crowdsource top, I'm going to have the fermentation top, plus we have a recipe book and some other goodies. So for those Great. of you who are joining right now, um, I'm going to, well, you know, I'll discuss with Hannah. Maybe, Hannah, we can have yeah. a behind-the-scenes discussion. We're going to post it tomorrow anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do we yeah. can do a joint giveaway, which would be really good. Then we'll share it on your feed, share it on my feed, yeah. and then you know we'll we'll make a little celebration out of a giveaway. I love giveaways. <laughs> so so just well, how for does, those of how does this work? Is it like an uh, airlock? Yeah, so, is yeah, it yeah. like what is the technology? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, it's an airlock, but but it's totally uh, it's made out of really high quality stainless steel. So there's no reaction with salt or brine, and then basically it just works. So this is the press and the spring. And the spring has a downward weight of about okay. one and a half pounds. So that's going to act as the weight. And then this is a moat. So you lock it on like this, right? And then you put it over your jar. And then, oh, by the way, I, uh, I have a stainless steel ring. 
that would be mm. part of the giveaway. So no more nice. tossing those rings when they, no they rusting. rust. No yeah. rusting. So once you have it set up like this, you let this little guy go down. And the downward weight is going to keep everything submerged underneath. Right. And then you fill the moat with just regular tap water. That becomes your water seal or your airlock. And you put the cap on. And then that's it. But because there's a so little easy. opening right here, the CO2 yes. escapes. So super, super easy. Um, practically indestructible because stainless steel, um, no plastic. There's a little silicone gasket and it's totally dishwasher safe. And then um, again, it fits onto any wide mouth mason jar. So it's pretty simple. <laughs> it's ingenious. I love it. So anyone who wants to make Thank those you. smaller batches at home without having yeah. massive amounts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you don't have easy. to have. But you know, honestly, if you give me a second, whoa, you know, I based the design on these these. <laughs> Right. I can barely lift right. this, but I'm like the harsh crocs this, and the traditional crocs. This croc, you know, has that has that mode and the cover. I based it on this and just drag it down. But then yeah. you so have I, to have separate I, weights. So what I yeah, love exactly. is that yours There's has the weight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yours has the weight and the pressure so that it stays submerged because it's when it's above the liquid level that's when the mold can grow on it. And so by exactly. making sure that's it's everything below the less yeah. level, it stays safe. Yeah. That's why this thing is like totally clean. You know, like I said, there's a little dark thing here and the bride has dried out, but because it's kept very um, safe here, it hasn't, it hasn't gone weird, you know, on me yet. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Give it time, it'll get weird. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, thanks again, Karen, so, for being here today. How can people find you? Where should they be looking uh, for you on Instagram so or the internet? So if you want to, um, yeah, so my, my Instagram handle is at Kraut, C-R-A-U-T underscore source so at crowdsource and then my website is crowdsource.com so you can go there join our mailing list and then i'm always offering free webinars and maybe hannah i can invite you to join um i would love to in the future which would be great yeah um and then there's recipes um and if you have a question feel free to email me karen at crowdsource.com Perfect. Thank you so much, Karen. Really appreciate you hanging Thank in there you. with all the technical difficulties. Such great wisdom. No problem. <laughs> really loved having you. Thanks, Thank Hannah. you, everybody. We'll, we'll see you next time. Giveaway. Okay. okay. Bye. 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 Have a good Monday, everyone. Yes. Micro Bye -bye. Monday. Micro Monday. I like that. <laughs> Super. <laughs>